complexes, complices, you're the man with the imperial degree, you tell me. Uh, do you need one to pronounce that word? I don't know, but okay. By SMN, a size resorb by nitrate for the surgical, for the, for the, the surgical, surgical population. <laughs> and I had, to, I had to memorize it this morning. The English is very hard. Um, <laughs> did you take your statins this morning? And my blood pressure medications. Blood pressure medication. Excellent, excellent. Today we're talking about atrial fibrillation. Absolutely, comes up all the time. Critical care. As surgeons, we don't always like talking about the critical care stuff, but uh, it's very important because remember, every single station has the same number of points in your exam. It's not a case of just being excellent in your own subspecialty. It could be, you know, good across the board. So atrial fibrillation, let's do it. What's the definition of atrial fibrillation? Atrial fibrillation is, in very simple terms, is an unregulated or discoordinated activity of the atrium. And that usually results in irregular, irregular pulse. What are the causes, do you say, of atrial fibrillation? Good question. And that's what they will ask you. Maybe not so directly, they may give you a scenario, but they may actually ask at some point, even if they do give you a scenario, they may ask you exactly what the causes are. The scenario are. is coming. And the scenario is coming. Great. Carl Wayne. There's, there's, there's always more. And the important thing is, like everything we talked about when you've been asked to give a differential diagnosis or treatments, is to have things in boxes. So you'd start off by saying the causes of atrial fibrillation are quite wide, but broadly they can be categorized as cardiac causes, so things that are to do with the heart, um, systemic uh, pathology, medical therapy or medication related, uh, and, and that's your main kind of three uh, boxes. So then you go back to each one and say cardiac causes is quite straightforward. It's usually existing ischemic heart disease or a myocardial infarction. Systemic causes, again, you need to have subcategories. They can be due to sepsis and infection, which is usually the kind of scenario they like giving you eye from an anastomotic leak. Not, not that we ever have one. No, no, never had, never had the problem. Uh, there's, <laughs> there's a case report where someone reverts back into sinus following a PR exam because of the increased vagal tone. So an RCT, I think that happened. <laughs> it's good to have non-surgical input into these things, and, and, and our, our colleague there, being a trainee GP, has very helpfully reported that N equals one case report that you'll never see again. The systemic pathologies are infections, clots such as pulmonary embolism, electrolyte imbalance, metabolic pain, uh, hypothermia and hypovolemia and hypotension. So they're the, they're the main systemic ones. Then there's drug therapy. The whole, and that could be because the patient hasn't had the usual drugs that they're on to control their existing AF, or it could be other drugs that actually cause AF. Drug withdrawal as well, mainly benzodiazepine, uh, alcohol, and uh, cocaine, um, which, you know, is never used in the population in the area that I work in. Never, never. Uh, they're the kind of broad categories that you want to put them into. It's day five post subjectomy. Your patient has miraculously, miraculously survived your operation five days now, and uh, it's the ward round in the morning, and their heart rate is 130. Yeah. Their systolic is 100. Their saturation is 94% on four liters of oxygen. And their background includes type 2 diabetes, as well as uh, ischemic heart disease, for which they take ISMN. It's isosorbide mononitrate for surgical, birth, for the, <laughs> the surgical <laughs> population. And I had to I had to memorize it this morning. Yeah. And and um, their chest drain is swinging. It's day five, you're still keeping the chest drain in, but okay. Um, there's no it's serious human serious fluid. They're talking, they're they're talking their setup. They're a bit slightly short of breath. And that scenario painted could be uh, you know, they can give you a colorectal patient. They can give you just about any patient. It doesn't really matter. It's the same thing. And you start off by saying this is a, clearly a, a very serious situation where the patient is in physiological extremis. Or in the, and my concerns would be, and then you'd say what? So the concerns here are going to be mainly you're going to be worried about anastomotic leak um, or infection, sepsis, one of the main causes in the surgical scenarios with regards to AF. It could also be cardiac as well because of the pre-existing cardiac situation you told us about. It could also be electrolyte imbalances and fluid uh, resuscitation. Pulmonary embolism, of course, and somebody who's, had, uh, who's got cancer and has had a major resection. And a thoracotomy. Uh, and a thoracotomy. Um, uh, minimally invasive, surely. Still a thoracotomy. <laughs> yes. Yeah, open-assisted. Open-assisted. Uh, yeah. Leg-assisted. Leg assisted. <laughs> With any patient who is uh, critically unwell, I would assess the patient as per the CRISP protocol ensuring assessment and simultaneous resuscitation and treatment. And at that point, they usually, you'd mentioned that 
uh, you would, uh, and, and you don't want to get bogged down into the A, B, C, D cannula. It's a having ensured that I have familiarized myself with the patient's notes, if you're, if you're not the operating surgeon, because they may say a colleague operated on your patient uh, on a Saturday afternoon or something. And having familiarized myself with the patient history and how they've been doing in the last, and their progress in a post-operative period by looking, by reviewing all the charts, ensuring that relevant investigations, including blood tests, ECG, maybe chest X-ray, blood gas, remember your sepsis six, have been uh, have been obtained uh, uh, an adequate risk fluid resuscitation antibiotics given. I would look for the underlying cause as to the patient's condition, and they usually say, "Oh, you mentioned ECG. That you see this. What would you see on ECG if it is a AF situation?" So we really look at everything, succinct fashion. Look at the op notes. Look at the past medical history, anesthetic sheet, uh, anesthetic sheet. Um, to give anesthetic sheet. Anesthetic sheet. Yeah. Anesthet it's a new type of sheath we're bringing in. Absolutely. Um, anesthetic sheet, look at the background patient. Sponsored by the telecom, it's the <laughs> Look at all of that. As part of the ECG, this is AF uh, station that we're looking at. So the ECG findings are you don't find any P waves. Yeah. You're finding irregular QRS complices. Complexes, complices, you're the man with the imperial degree, you tell me. Uh, Do you need one to pronounce that word? I don't know, but okay. Is the English is very hard. Uh, you're looking at this in the context of the systolic as well to tell if it's fast AF or not. What is the definition of fast AF? Fast AF is a tachycardia, which technically speaking would be about 90 now rather than 100, but certainly they're not going to give you something that's borderline. Like 90 is meant to be more accounting tachycardia now, but don't get into the weeds of it as, uh, as, this, as they say, because they're, they're not going to give you something very borderline. They're going to be somebody who's got a heart rate 125, yeah. something like that. And they're also going to say, as part of your assessment, of course, the blood pressure, they're going to say, oh, well, actually, the blood pressure is low. And that's the key bit, isn't it? It's the physiological impact that this dysrhythmia has, uh, rather than just, you know, somebody can be completely well with a heart rate of 95, that's in AF. Mm. Um, but somebody, so, so it's really the, the impact it has on the blood pressure and the circulation. And they will give you that. So you've done the ECG, there's no PR, uh, there's no P waves, you QR complexes are all over the place. There's no inverted or uh, raised T waves, so there's no suspicion of MI. Well, that means, yeah. I don't know what that means. That's the only thing we know what that means. <laughs> Just make sure the ECU, you're not all <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> the, the, oh. the writing's on the top, yeah. <laughs> and, and, um. But with the, the ECG is a squiggly stuff on a pink paper, just the case. Just, just, just give it to your F1, just the, they'll interpret it for you. And you've done, you've gone through the, the whole of the checklist, you've got CT scans, there are no major leaks, you've done an OGD, the, the conduit is not dead. This is just AF from the insult of injury as you, mm -hmm. uh, in, insult of surgery as you have identified. Um, what would you do now? Okay, so the statement that you want to make here is my overriding st strategy would be to control, and here is the rate. So whenever you get a scenario like this, irrespective of AF or anything else, it would be good to just let the examiner know what you're thinking, and that's the higher level thinking they keep talking about. So it's not just a bit about just delving in, but having an appreciation of what your overall management direction you want to go towards and making it known that you are flexible to change that as the, 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 the situation evolves. So in this scenario, my overall strategy is to establish a good circulation pattern to establish rate rather than rhythm. So you're not trying to bring them back into sinus rhythm. You're trying to, I mean, that'd be great, but what your main priority is making sure they're not getting 125, 140, 150 and, and, and into ischemia, and especially an elderly patient. With this in mind, I'm going to initi uh, in, initiate a, a set of treatments as per the NICE protocol um, in line with the CRISP, uh, alongside the CRISP uh, protocol treatments we've already initiated, so that's oxygen, fluid resuscitation, antibiotics if need be. Uh, and, and then you want to specifically say how you're going to treat the rate, how you're going to treat Shout the out to Mr. Ed Chong for uh, teaching me this. So it's A, B, C, D. Uh, a is amiodarone. I think it's 300 milligrams as a loading dose, stat. Um, and you're, doing, you, you're going, doing, going about this with support from your medical and yeah, so colleagues. As always, you're going to say, uh, this is going to be highlighted as, and, and to uh, colleagues and treated in an MDT kind of fashion. You, you want the intensivist or the anesthetist and the medical consultant or registrar involved. And some on the board have on guard trust, uh, 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 and a man photographs. But you're loading those 300 milligrams of um, your drone. Yeah. Um, 
and you might also choose to load them up with bisoprolol. Yeah, Thank so you that's your A and B, so beta blocker. So am I running a short acting beta, uh, or, an, or a quick acting beta blocker? Uh, bisoprolol, um, I think five, five milligrams was the first um, shot. And then you monitor how that goes. You might choose to repeat the bisoprolol or then move on to calcium channel blockers. Yep. Uh, Some places do keep um, more um, shorter acting ones like metemplimol. Metemplimol and beta lot. Uh, do what your trust says, but ultimately, as soon as you say, it, as long as you say beta blocker of sorts, it's usually the right answer. Calcium channel blocker, and then assess what that does. And then lastly, again, with advice from your medical colleagues, you might start a digoxin regimen with loading dose maintenance and then reducing it. That's your A, B, C, D, uh, and it's always good to, uh, you know, to uh, keep things nice and simple for us surgeons. So your A is your hemlodopy. Um, B is your beta blocker, C is a cal... Not, not simple, not simple enough, <laughs> not simple enough. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. We'll write in crayon next time. Um, I'm not a B, does, does the thing with a mixture of systolic a bit lower or higher? I don't know, but yeah, sorry. It's am amyodra, thank you. Um, and a beta blocker, a calcium channel blocker, and the jogs. Okay, and you also want to say, because especially if the patient's in hypotensive and, and you know, in, in physiological difficulty, Monitored bed, monitored bay, card, CCU, ICU, HDU, time observation, so you can see your response to treatment. And once you've given your ABCD, you also want to make sure that if there is an underlying cause, which they may give you a scenario like a chest infection or a leak or something, you also want to make, or they're very dehydrated, they haven't had enough fluids, you want to make sure that you are correcting that as well. So you're not just focusing on giving people a whole bunch of drugs without actually treating the underlying cause. Absolutely. Um, and lastly, for the medic, if the drugs fail, what's the last, what, what, what else? The last thing would be to undergo uh, DC cardioversion, so electrical cardioversion, that's usually done uh, in the anesthetic room on the theatre, um, under sedation uh, with a medical registrar or consultant present, and obviously uh, anaesthetist as well, uh, somewhere where they can be safely monitored and they cardioversion. If that really fails or if that is partially successful or really successful, they may even require a uh, a pacemaker, and that may be a um, a temporary pacemaker, but that is not something that you're going to go um, in, in into great detail with. Yeah, but just some an awareness. So they're the stage. So it's the drugs, cardioversion, and possibly a, a pacemaker of sorts, temporary or otherwise. If they are rate controlled and uh, but they're getting better, they're about to be discharged, but they are still in AF, then you would start to have a conversation with the hematologist about keeping them anticoagulated. Yeah. Um, on the long term there's two kind of scoring systems you need to know one is the risk of stroke and the risk of kind of um, thromboembolic um, incident and that's the CHAD VASC 2 and that is a composite score that you get there's an online calculator and the, all the categories uh, you don't really need to know I mean I think you did for part one uh, so hopefully you may remember some of it but um, for part for part B rather uh, for the for the actual viva, you don't really need to know the subgroups, but just know there's a Chad Basque two score, and then there's also the risk of okay, you're going to anticoagulate to reduce the risk of stroke or thromboembolic uh, events. What's the risk of your your management causing bleeding? And that used to be the hazard bled, but it's now the orbit, and that's the new gui nice guideline. They're the two scores you need to know, and that's ultimately, of course, you're going to alert the GP on, uh, through your discharge summary, which I'm sure will be comprehensive and not at all have massive gaps in it. Um, and the uh, you're going to make, want to make sure this patient is followed up. If there is an underlying cardiological problem or they've got existing cardiological issues, you want uh, your cardiology colleagues to follow them up and, and see them and write to them as well. And again, you may think, well, this is kind of is this really exam things? But this is one of the things that people don't score very highly on is the higher level thinking, and that's what they want you to say. So even though it's not something you're going to do yourself, it's just having that awareness and not you just... Support network as a yeah, clinician, basically. You, you, you remember for your MRCS, it was all about patients really unwell, I, you know, I need to fix it kind of thing, just do the immediate thing. But for your FRCS, it's really about the wider long-term health and picture of, uh, that you want to be involved in and statements like this, like communicating with GP colleagues uh, and colleagues in, in kind of secondary care uh, or even referral to a tertiary center for whatever reason, is what's going to tick your, oh, this person's got a holistic, overall, higher level thinking box. Great. And that's it. You'll be, you'll be pleased to know that it's going to be a quick station. Uh, it's, It'll be a five-minute station, probably even less, because they may throw two things at you. You're, you're limited by the knowledge that everyone in the room has. Not. <laughs>
which is usually uh, going to be less than what you already know, but uh, don't get bogged down into the specific details, but just have the higher or the level thinking and make sure you're progressing and make sure you are uh, involving your colleagues. That's it. Nice.